Robert Menasse, you're Austrian and one of today's most important German language authors. You're a passionate champion of Europe and the European Union. And that's the subject of your latest novel, The Capital. It's come out at a time when many people are upset about the EU with all its internal divisions. And they don't care much for Eurocrats. Are you hopelessly idealistic? Um. You can support the idea of Europe and still be very critical of the current state of the EU. Anything else would be ridiculous. If you ignore problems, you lose credibility. If you want to advance the European project, you have to criticize the way things are right now. The concept is worth defending. We need to develop a vision of what we want for the continent on the basis of something that can be summed up in a single sentence, something that everyone can agree with. No European country, not even large states like Germany, will be able to master on its own the great challenges that we face. People know that, but Europe is still unpopular. You chose to study how the EU works. You went to Brussels to do research for your novel, which won the German Book Award. Tell us about the EU officials you met there. Do they do as bad a job as many people believe? No, on the contrary. It is not the case that EU officials are not qualified, especially at the European Commission. That's not the problem. The problem concerns the institutional and systemic contradictions within the European Union. Who has the final word within the structure of the EU? It's the European Council. It has the final decision-making power. The heads of government, mm -hmm. the heads of state and government of the member states. And that's the contradiction. Common European policy is developed and decided on by the leaders of nation states. We've got to get away from that if we want to see a European Republic. Most of the officials in the European Commission are highly qualified. They speak several languages, they've studied at top universities, and they came to Brussels out of idealism because they want to work on the European project. They really are very qualified and they come up with sensible policies. But they're blocked by the heads of state and their national self-interest. Yes, in the European Council. The officials draft intelligent policies, and commission in Insiders call these drafts sacrificial offerings, because when they're presented to the Council, they're torn apart. That's what has caused this crisis. That's the basic contradiction. And it's also why we failed to find solutions to many of our problems, and failed to create the legal framework we need. Some member state or other is always against this or that out of self-interest. We see the EU failing to act as one. Britain has voted for Brexit. Eastern European countries don't want to take in refugees. Italy wants to take on more and more debt. How would you describe the current state of Europe? I don't accept the way that you framed the question. One country doesn't want this, another doesn't want that. Italy wants to borrow more money. The Poles don't want refugees. But that's what's happening. No, we have to go beyond the symptoms and look at the basic issue. Take the so-called refugee question. What should we do with refugees? That presupposes that we should adopt a common asylum and refugee policy in Europe. But since we don't have one, each country does as it likes. So it doesn't work. And as far as the Italians and debt are concerned, it's grotesque to talk about nation states and their budgets in the context of a common market and a common currency. We have not yet learned, or don't want to learn, that we no longer have nation states that have distinct economies. 
countries. That's especially true in Germany, a world champion exporter. Once we understand that, we can develop an economic policy. Until then, they all do as they please, and the problem continues. So what's the solution? How does that play out in foreign policy? Can Europe find its voice in dealing with President Trump, for example? Europe will continue to exist long after Trump is gone. I'm actually quite grateful to him for forcing Europe to free itself a little and become more self-confident. But your question is, how can we solve the EU's underlying problems? To that I would say, we can't do that from one day to the next. Lots of little steps add up to major advances. The crisis is forcing us to take a few small steps again. In the long run, some states will have to temper their self-interest and soften their tone, given the prospect of their decline and fall. Still, nationalism is on the rise in Europe. Why do you think that is? It has to do with the system. As long as we only have national elections to legitimize politicians and policies, it's going to continue like this. Politicians know that they are elected at the national level. And I mean all of them, not just right-wing populists and right-wingers. I mean centrists, too. They all know that they have to continue to claim that they're defending the interests of their respective countries, even though that's a mere fiction, because if they didn't, they might lose their jobs. You say that national self-interest is rooted in the system. But doesn't it also have to do with disruptive phenomena like digitalization and globalization? Are we searching for a group identity, a sense of homeland? Doesn't that also contribute to nationalism? I think that's a pretty shallow explanation for nationalism. You can have a sense of belonging and homeland without being a nationalist. You can have a deep sense of group identity without this abstract idea of having the same passport as certain other people. No, nationalism is based in the system. You strike me as a passionate anti-nationalist. Is that perhaps rooted in your family history? Your father escaped at the age of eight to England on a Kindertransport a rescue mission for Jewish children. Has that influenced your thinking? It wasn't just my father who had to flee and seek asylum. My family is very grateful to those who took in my relatives back then and saved their lives. Um, as we try to build a democratic Europe, national identity is the least important thing. It is so manifestly irrational. Just consider Austria. For me, people who live in Bratislava, for example, just 40 minutes from Vienna, are so close in terms of mentality and history and culture. They're city dwellers like me. And we're talking here about the capital of another country. Given all the great crimes that have been committed in the name of nations over the course of history, I consider the idea of the nation dead. The project of European unification is the response to that. And you champion that cause with passion. Your father, Hans, is a football legend in Austria. He was a soccer champion and played on the national team. You also love the game yourself. In a friendly match, Austria just beat Germany for the first time in 32 years. Did you, as an ardent anti-nationalist, feel even a tiny spark of national sentiment when Austria won? No, I didn't. I watched the match. It was clear that for Germany it was just practice. But Austria got all worked up about it. 
wenn es um was geht. Aber, aber you were pleased. Ich habe mich darüber gefreut. I was pleased that there was some decent play in the second half, but I don't care about national teams. I think that in the World Cup, each country should put together a team of its best players, without regard to what passport they might have. We'll be sure to pass on your proposal to FIFA. Now, as our interview draws to a close, I'd like you to complete three sentences for us. First, I wrote the world's first novel about the European Union because... I wanted to talk about the world we live in and how it came to be. I wanted to understand it. French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Angela Merkel want to reform the EU. I say that is um, necessary at the practical level, but not satisfactory because I did not have the opportunity to vote for either Mr. Macron or Ms. Merkel. In the kind of Europe I envisioned, there would be no more leaders or leading nations. How much time does Europe have to reinvent itself? I'd say two generations, for one simple reason. I call today's young people the Erasmus generation. The Erasmus program lets them study anywhere in the EU, and they will be in charge soon. We don't need to explain to them what Europe is all about. They're creating a new reality, and the generation after them will know how to advance Europe's development. Robert Manasseh, thank you very much. My pleasure.